From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Joe McNabb, Northeast Indemnity. Hi, Joe. Good to hear your voice. It's not mutual, Johnny. And I always thought you cared. Whenever I hear your voice, it's because I'm in trouble. Oh, what is it this time? Ever hear of Harvey Stone? Sure, the Stone Corporation. And Stone Enterprises and the Stone Foundation. Sounds like he's a foundation himself. Practically. Late 30s bachelor. Took over the management from his father, E.J., when the old boy got crippled up with arthritis last year. So? So the total amount of insurance we're carrying on him is over 100000 So? He lives in New York, Westchester County. Last night he was driving along a road in the country. A small object hit his windshield. Oh, look, Joe, don't tell me you want me to investigate a claim for a broken windshield. I sure do, Johnny. That small object was a bullet. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey in the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar... To Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an account of expenditures during my investigation of the imperfect alibi matter. Expense account item one, one dollar even, taxi to the office of Northeast Indemnity where Joe McNabb was waiting for me. It's kind of a complicated situation, Johnny. Yeah, well, it usually is when people get shot at, Joe. Now, mind, we're not sure the bullet was meant for Harvey Stone. He's inclined to brush the whole thing off, think somebody might have been doing a little target practice in the woods. Stray shot, huh? Well, could be. Yes, yes, but with the kind of insurance we're carrying on... Yeah, him, better give me a rundown on him. Harvey's father, E.J., built up the business, a widower. Two years ago, he remarried. Last year, he had to retire. He's in a wheelchair now. I see. Well, now Harvey is running things. Lives with his father and stepmother in a big place in Westchester County, but he also keeps a small apartment on East 57th in Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Any trouble in the family? Anything like that? Harry's been running around lately with a supper club singer named Helen Barrett. I gather he's thinking of marrying her. I also gather his family is bitterly opposed to the idea. How about Harvey's business affairs? Could he have made any enemies there? One, at least. Who? Oh. Dutch Krieger. Know him? Yeah, I sure do. A gambler with a lot of dough behind him and a couple of gunsels in front. That's the one. How come he got mixed up with a character like Krieger? He didn't. Refused to. Come again. Krieger's put on a big act about going legitimate. Young Stone was negotiating a sizable real estate transaction recently. Found out that Krieger was one of the associates in the deal. He threatened to call it all off. Made the other associates kick Krieger out. Oh, Dutch wouldn't forget a thing like that. No, he wouldn't. Well, who's the beneficiary on Stone's insurance policy? His father and stepmother jointly. Johnny, I smell trouble. I want you to go down there and nose around, see what you can turn up. And do me a slight favor. Sure. What is it? Keep Harvey Stone alive, will you? Expense account item two, $12.50, transportation and incidentals to the Stone Estate in Westchester County. It was one of those massive, dignified-looking places nestling comfortably in about 10 acres of grounds. The butler showed me into a room only about half as big as Grand Central Station, so I wandered around inspecting the paneling and the Italian works of art. Then I zeroed in on one of the paintings. It involved a luscious lady, a bunch of grapes, and a pool of water. Nice, isn't it? Hmm? Yeah. The painting, I mean. Quite nice, isn't it? Oh, <laughs> yeah, if you like grapes. You must be... I'm uh... Mrs. Stone, Mr. Dollar. Daphne Stone. Mrs., I didn't know the wedding had taken place. My, you are behind the times. It took place two years ago. Two? Well, I, uh... I'm Mrs. E.J. Stone. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, uh, is your, uh, stepson here? Harvey, he should be back any minute. He had to run into the city. But let me give you a tip, Mr. Dollar. Don't call Harvey my stepson in front of him. Oh. You see, he and I are just about the same age, and he's... Yeah, oh, okay, I'll remember. Uh, how about Harvey's father? Is he here? Yes, 
My husband will be along in just a moment. He has to get around in a wheelchair now, but he's very stubborn. Won't let anyone push him. Well, uh, Mrs. Stone, I think you know why I'm here. Yes, of course. About that absurd thing that happened to Harvey last night. Absurd? Well, isn't it ridiculous to think that it was an attempt on his life? After all, he will go tearing around these roads at night in his sports car. Probably someone out hunting. Is that what you think, Mrs. Stone? What else could it be? Nobody has any reason to kill Harvey. Everything harmonious here at home, I suppose. Of course. How about Harvey's plans to marry Helen Barrett? Oh, yes, that. That? Mr. Dollar, say, I'm getting a little weary of that name. It's Johnny, isn't it? Yeah. And Daphne. Johnny, let me give you another tip. <laughs> you seem to be full of them. Uh, what's this one, Daphne? I wouldn't mention Harvey's fiancé to his father. Oh? Mr. Stone is quite violently opposed to the match. How about you, Daphne? How do you feel about it? Why, anything Harvey wants. Oh, Edward, this is Mr. Dollar. Yes, yes, I know. Hello, Mr. Stone. That idiot McNabb from the insurance company phoned me about you, Dollar. Worries like an old woman. Seems to think that fool accident Harvey had last night was an attempted murder. Oh, he's just taking normal precautions, Mr. Stone. Precautions. Well, just as well, I suppose. Harvey could use a nursemaid... He always manages to get things fouled up somehow. Now, Edward, You want to see my orchids, Dollar? Orchids? Of course you do. This way, out in the solarium. Okay. Oh, here, let me push you. Never mind. I can manage. All my good advice. Sorry, Daphne. This way, Dollar. I'll have a drink for you when you're ready, Johnny. Thanks. Well, here we are. Well, some orchids. Who cares about orchids? Just wanted to talk to you. Well? What do you make of this business, Dollar? About Harvey, I mean. That bullet in his windshield last night. You really figure somebody's trying to kill him? Well, I, I don't know, Mr. Stone. That's why I'm here to find out. Well, I don't know who it'd be. Harvey's not a bad sort, really. Terrible businessman. Oh? How so? Oh, I could run the Stone Corporation better than he does for my wheelchair. He uh, doesn't do things your way, huh? Nothing's like it used to be. Everything's done differently now. Maybe it has to be. Has to be. Business is business. Yeah, well, how about his fiance? I suppose you disapprove of her, too. Helen Barrett? <laughs> no, by golly, I... I've got to hand it to Harvey there. Don't quite know how we managed to land someone like her. Wait a minute. You mean you're not opposed to his marrying her? More power to him. Chip off the old block, I guess. What's that mean? Oh, I did the same thing. That's what. Picked himself a Broadway girl. You mean Mrs. Stone, Daphne? Right out of musical comedy. I see. How does she feel about Helen Barrett? Yeah, it won't seem to warm up to her. Oh, well, how can you figure out a woman? Yeah, how can you? So it's Daphne that disapproves of Helen. Well, that's very interesting. Interesting? It's a nuisance. Here's your drink, Johnny. Oh, oh, thanks, Daphne. Uh, Mr. Stone, you're not having any? No, that fool doctor of mine says no. Edward, you look tired. Perhaps you'd better rest. Tired? Now. Who's tired? Well, then just one more question, Mr. Stone. What is it? Do you know of anyone who might want to kill Harvey? Once in a while, I sure would. Edward. I tell you, when I think of how he's running that business into the ground, I could... I could wring his neck. Edward, it's no time for jokes. Johnny, this whole thing is ridiculous. Harvey hasn't an enemy in the world. Well, have you gotten me nicely taken apart by now, people? Oh, Harvey, dear. Hello, Daphne. Father? Well, this is Dollar, Harvey. Jimmy, isn't it? Uh, Johnny. Yes, I heard Mr. Dollar was coming. And why? How are you? You look tired, Harvey. Let me fix you a drink. Thanks. Darling. Thanks, darling. <laughs> you know, Dollar, sometimes I wonder which one of us is married to Daphne. That was a perfectly charming thing to say, Edward. Yes, Father, you seem to be in unusually good form tonight. This is for the benefit of our guests, no doubt. Uh, uh, look, if I could just talk to you for a moment, Harvey. Oh, don't mind these little exchanges, Johnny. If you're around this place very long, you'll get used to them. Ah, good night. Good night, Father. Mr. Stone. Like a drink now, Harvey? Oh, never mind, Daphne. I can manage. All right. I'll go on up then. I hope we'll be seeing you again, Johnny. Oh, you probably will. Good night. I, um, I'm sorry about that business with Father just now, Johnny. Most of the time, he thinks it's fine that Daphne and I get on so well together, but sometimes he doesn't. I suppose now he's in the wheelchair, he feels the difference in their ages even more. Yeah. 
And ever since I've taken over the management of the corporation, well... Oh, I'm sure he must have made it very clear he doesn't approve of my policies. And he's probably right. Oh? Well, my heart's not in it, really. But somebody had to take over. Look, uh, Harvey, you said you knew why I was here. Oh, sure. About that silly business last evening. Well, what exactly happened? Well, I have a new sports car that I'm fond of. I went for a drive. You know, there are some pretty good country roads around here. Mm -hmm. And I slowed for a sharp turn. And I heard what I thought was a backfire. But my windshield shattered. It was a bullet. Well, what'd you do then? I stopped to warn whoever it was to keep away from the roads. It didn't occur to you that somebody might be trying to kill you. Oh, well, good Lord, no. Look, Johnny, I used to roam these woods when I was a kid, taking pot shots at fence posts. That's obviously what happened last night. You didn't see anyone when you stopped? No, it was probably some kid. He's probably still running. And you can't think of anyone who might want to kill you? Of course not. How about Dutch Krieger? Krieger, the gambler? I understand he was involved in a business deal you were thinking of making. You refused to go through with it until his associates dumped him. Of course. After all, the name Stone does have a pretty honorable history. I couldn't very well have it connected with somebody like Krieger. Well, Dutch wouldn't forget a thing like that. Uh, look, about your fiance, Helen Barrett. Uh, Johnny, I suggest you can find your questions to subjects not quite so personal. All right, so I sound nosy, but you're heavily insured, Harvey, and that bullet last night could have been meant for you. My job is to find out if there's anyone who could possibly have any reason to kill you. There isn't. Do you know of anyone who's opposed to your marriage? I told you I'd rather not talk about that. Anyway, there's a good chance there isn't going to be any marriage. No. What do you mean? Look, Johnny, I have a good idea. It's almost time for the last train into the city. I'll drive you to the station. <laughs> A polite but firm message that the interview was over. Harvey got called to the phone and I went outside to wait for him. Daphne had lied when she told me Harvey's father opposed the marriage to nightclub singer Helen Barrett. It was Daphne who didn't like the idea. She and Harvey seemed pretty chummy and the old man didn't seem to like that. Harvey had crossed a rough boy named Dutch Krieger in a business deal and it's a cinch Dutch didn't like that. And now Harvey just told me there might not be a marriage, which indicated some kind of trouble there. All in all, it looked like a cozy little powder keg. Then as I started for Harvey's car, the keg exploded right in my stomach in the form of a fist. I couldn't see who they were, but the two of them really knew their business, the way they worked me over. Hard enough to hurt, not hard enough to put me out. Finally, I guess they got bored. One of them did me a favor. He put me away. <laughs> Here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow? Well, look, you should never get in a card game with a professional gambler. He can deal you any card he wants, even the ace of spades. The death card. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Ristelli at Homicide, Johnny. I was out when you called. Anything new on the Harvey Stone killing, Joe? Not a thing, but maybe we've already got all we need. Meaning Helen Barrett? We're still holding her. Joe, I don't think she did it. No? Oh, I know it all adds up to her, but... Well, just call it a hunch. Hunches are fine, Johnny, but facts are better. You want to hear some facts? I'll be right over. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. <laughs> expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar. To the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter. Location, New York City. Expense account continued. <laughs> Item 8, $1.40. Cab fare to police headquarters from my hotel to talk to Lieutenant Joe Rostelli. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Facts, you said. Facts. Number one. 
Harvey Stone was shot on the left side of the forehead at close range with a 38 caliber Smith & Wesson. The gun was near the body. Any prints on it? No, it was clean. But Helen Barrett had gloves with him. Helen says she left Harvey's apartment and went to her own to pack up. They were going to elope. When she got back to his apartment, he was dead. So she told me, Johnny. I'd like to believe her, too. She seems like a pretty nice kid, but... Uh, but what? Not enough facts in her favor. Who saw her leave Stone's apartment? We can't find anyone who did. What time did she leave? She can't remember. Did anyone see her return? What time? That's a lot of questions not to be able to answer, Johnny. Yeah, yeah, I know. What was the time of death? Medical examiner figures it's somewhere between 11.30 and midnight. Well, Helen told me she thought it was about 11 when she left Harvey's apartment and about midnight when she returned. Yeah, about. Even if she did leave, she only lives a few blocks away. It's a lot of time unaccounted for, Johnny. Yeah. Better fill me in on what you know. Well, as I get it, Harvey Stone took over the management of his father's corporation when old E.J. took to a wheelchair about a year ago. Yeah, yeah, I know. Two years ago, old E.J. married an ex-chorus girl named Daphne. Yeah, yeah. Well, she's about Harvey's age. The two of them were apparently pretty friendly, and the old man was bothered by it occasionally. Incidentally, he and Daphne are joint beneficiaries on Harvey's insurance policy. A hundred and fifty thousand worth. Sounds like you're trying to tie the old man into the killing. Be quite a stretch, Johnny, from his wheelchair up in Westchester County to Harvey's apartment on East 57. I know, but right now I'm more interested in Daphne. Oh? I told you last night I thought Dutch Krieger was mixed up in this. I went to his office afterward and spotted a picture of Daphne Stone on his wall. Inscription, all my love, signed Daphne. You think Daphne got Dutch to do her and himself a favor, huh? That's a possibility, isn't it? Sure, sure, it's a possibility. Trouble is, there are all kinds of possibilities. Right now, I got to stick with a probability. Helen Barrett. Uh-huh. How are you doing on motive for her? Not good, not bad. We know there was some question as to whether they were going to be married or not. Helen says the hesitation was on her part. But suppose it was the other way around. Harvey decided not to go through with the marriage? Yeah. Getting cut out of the stone money would hurt some girls plenty. Maybe this was her way of getting even with him for breach of promise. <laughs> You know, Joe, for a guy who loves facts, seems to me you're edging over into hunches, too. Well, I admit it isn't a closed case by a long shot. So let's get back to facts. Harvey was shot in the forehead with a 38 Smith & Wesson sometime between 11.30 and... Excuse me. Vestelli speaking. Who? What about? Oh, well, send him in. Somebody wants to see me about the killing. Oh, you Lieutenant Rostelli? That's right. You're handling the stone killing? Trying to. I want to talk to you about it. Sit down. Thank you. What's your name? Gentry. Alvin Gentry. So what about the stone killing? I killed Harvey Stone. What? what? Let's have that again. I said, I killed Stone. I want to make a statement. Why did you kill him? He's making a play for my girl. I didn't like it. Your girl? You mean Helen Barrett? Who? Helen Barrett, Harvey Stone's fiance. No, I don't know her. I mean my girl, Doris, a hat check girl at Barney's. Well, go on, go on. Well, Stone was on the make for her. Every time he came in Barney's, he'd make a play for her. I told him to lay off, and he wouldn't. He asked her to go away with him. I went to his apartment, and I killed him. How'd you kill him? I shot him. Where? I told you, in his apartment. I mean, where did the bullet hit him? Oh, in the chest. What kind of gun did you use? Forty-five cold. What'd you do with the gun? I threw it in the river. Okay, Gentry, get out. What? I said, get out. But I told yeah, you... Yeah, you told me all right. Now I'm telling you, get out. Look, I don't understand. I'll tell you what you do. You just go on out of here and think it over. When you come back with a few facts straight... Facts? Yeah, like the caliber of the gun and where Stone was shot and the location of the gun. You get the facts straight and I'll be glad to listen to you. Now get out. Okay. Confessing Sam number one. Yeah, there's always a string of them. That's one reason we don't usually release the caliber of the gun to the papers, to help weed out these confessing Sam. wonder why they do it. Uh, a psychiatrist was explaining it to me once. Something to do with repressed feelings of guilt, I think he said. Next one will probably say he stabbed Harvey Stone with a letter opener. Yeah. Well, I'm going to run out and have a talk with Daphne. Stully speaking. What? Right. Now, look, Mike, you take the statement, huh? Thanks. 
Well, I was wrong about the letter opener, Johnny. Oh? We got a guy now who claims he used a razor on Harvey. Slit his throat from ear to ear. As I left, I spent about three minutes feeling sorry for Estelle and his crank confessions, but then I dropped that routine and started feeling sorry for my own problems. The case against Helen Barrett looked pretty bad, but I still kept thinking of Daphne Stone's picture in Dutch Krieger's office. Expense account item 9320, transportation to the Stone Estate in Westchester County. I was shown into the king-size drawing room again to wait for Daphne. But then I saw a very interesting sight that wiped Daphne out of my mind for a moment. It was old E.J.'s wheelchair at the door to the solarium. And what was unusual about it was that it was empty. I edged toward the door. Then I got a glimpse of E.J. puttering around his orchids. He spotted me, though, and hobbled quickly to his wheelchair. With an abrupt wave, he wheeled into the hall and out of sight. A couple of minutes later, in came Daphne. Hello, Johnny. Daphne. Look, you said it was important that you talk to me, but I really don't feel much like talking after what's happened. I'm sure you understand. I think so. How's E.J. taking it? My husband is reacting as I suppose any father would who'd just lost his son. He's bewildered and hurt. You didn't tell me E.J. could navigate without his wheelchair. I saw him a minute ago inspecting his orchids. The wheelchair was parked near the door. I... I didn't think it was important, Johnny. It's true, he can be out of his chair for short periods, but it's rather uncomfortable for him. Out of his chair for how long? Not long enough to get into New York and back, if that's what you're wondering. Thanks. You told me it was E.J. who was opposed to Harvey's plans to marry Helen Barrett, but I found out that you were the one who was fighting it. I suppose it was foolish of me to pretend otherwise. I guess I just didn't want you to get any wrong ideas. About what? About the reason I opposed it. What's the right idea? The name of stone means something, Johnny. Dignity, tradition, breeding. I doubt if someone like Helen Barrett, an entertainer, nice as she is, could keep that tradition alive. Are you kidding? I'm completely serious. Something like this happened once before with Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters. And you stopped it just like you were trying to stop him from marrying Helen. I don't like the way you put that. I merely persuaded him to think of the family name. <laughs> you know, you kill me, Daphne. What do you mean by that? This dose of blue blood you've picked up. Aren't you a Daphne come lady yourself? How dare you? Save it. E.J. told me he lifted you out of a chorus line when he married you. Now, how about it? Yes, it's true. So where do you get off I with this? I don't suppose you'd ever understand this, Johnny. But there are chorus girls and chorus girls. This I know. I had to support my mother somehow. But all the while, I knew that life wasn't for me. And when I got a chance at this life, I took it. And since I married Edward, I've lived the way anyone with the name of Stone should live. I've put my past behind me. Even Dutch Krieger? Dutch? Yeah. Yeah, I saw your picture on his office wall. He was part of the past. It doesn't exist anymore. Isn't it kind of a coincidence he tried to worm his way into one of Harvey's business deals? I had nothing to do with it. And Harvey acted correctly in refusing to have anything to do with Dutch. I see. Then you opposed Harvey's marriage to Helen to protect the family name, huh? Just as I opposed the previous attachment to his secretary. Sure it wasn't because you didn't like the idea of competition? That's a... That's a pretty low thing to say under the circumstances. Well, just what are the circumstances? It's... It's very simple. I've lost someone who was... very dear to me. Even though I was Harvey's stepmother, we were practically the same age. Sure. I know people talked about it, made crude jokes about it. But I didn't care. Because I found in Harvey something I'd never had in my life before. Oh? What was that? A friend, Johnny. A real friend. <laughs> I went back into the city. 
If I could only find somebody to establish the time period Helen had been away from Harvey's place. I went over to her apartment house, figuring there's always one tenant who knows everybody else's business. Five doorbells later, I found the one. Sure, I had to come in late, but I don't remember just what time. I was watching a program on the TV. There was this old man and woman. Yeah, with that yes, yes. Really, I, uh, what? You're sure it was Helen Barrett who came in? Well, I ought to be sure. She lives right under me. Besides, he was waiting for her, and they had a talk. I couldn't quite hear what they were saying. She kept telling him to quiet down. Well, I mean, I, well, I wasn't really paying any attention. It was No, no, of course not. You said he was waiting for her. Who do you mean? Friend of hers. At least he used to be. She used to go with him. Happen to remember his name? Sure. Gentry. Alvin Gentry. Alvin Gentry. It was Alvin Gentry who'd made the fake confession in Rostelli's office. At the time, there'd been nothing to tie him into the case. But now, according to Mrs. Carson, he was a friend of Helen's. My hunch about her innocence took a nosedive. Yeah, that confession he tried to make could be his way of trying to protect her. And that would add up to just one thing. Helen was guilty after all. Now here's our star to tell you about tomorrow's episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, up pops an eyewitness and drives the final nail into the wrong coffin. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Rostelli at Homicide returning your call, Johnny. I've uncovered a couple of items on the Harvey Stone killing, Joe. Good, let's have them. Remember Alvin Gentry? Frank, who made the fake confession in my office yesterday? Yeah, what about him? Looks like he's not a psycho after all. What do you mean? I just found out he's a friend of Helen Barrett's. Well, what do you know? Could be he was doing it to shield her. That sure doesn't look good for her, Johnny. Yeah, I gotta admit, my hunch about her innocence just took a nosedive. I also learned that Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters, used to be his girlfriend. Yeah, I'm up to date on that one. Matter of fact, Martha's in my office right now. Oh? Says she wants to make a statement. You want to hear it? You bet I do. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter, location, New York City. Expense account continued. Item 10, a $1.40 cab from my hotel to police headquarters. Martha Winters, secretary to the murdered man, Harvey Stone, was in Lieutenant Joe Rostelli's office. She was a blonde. And again, I had to admire the dead man's taste. He could really pick them. Miss Winters, would you mind telling Mr. Dollar here what you've just told me? No, not at all, Lieutenant. You see, Mr. Dollar, I have a small apartment in the same building as Mr. Stone's apartment. On East 57? Yes. Uh, Harvey, as Mr. Stone transacted most of the business at his apartment rather than the office when he was in town. That's mainly why he kept the apartment. And we felt it would be more convenient for me to be nearby. I see. Well, the night before last... The night of the murder... Yes. I'd been out to a show. I got home about 11.30. Go on. I saw Helen Barrett walking toward Mr. Stone's apartment. What? You sure about the time? Well, not right down to the second, of course, but I am positive it was within five minutes of 11.30. I see. Well, why did you wait until this morning to tell us this? Well, I... Come on, let's have it, Miss Winters. Well, naturally, no one likes to get mixed up in things like this, and... I didn't want to make trouble for anybody. Helen Barrett always seemed like a, a nice person. But Mr. Stone was my employer and my friend. And after thinking it over, I, I could see what my duty was. You say Harvey Stone was your friend. Was he anything more than that? I don't think I know what you mean, Mr. Dollar. I think you do. 
I understand that at one time you and Harvey were planning to be married. That's true. But that's all in the past. Oh? Yes, we decided mutually that it was a mistake. We've been friends ever since, but nothing more than that. I see. Well. Heard enough, Johnny? Yeah. Okay, Miss Winters, that'll be all. Thanks for coming in. We'll get in touch with you again if we need any further information. All right. Any time, Lieutenant. Well, Johnny, according to Martha Winters' statement, Helen Barrett was in Harvey's apartment at the approximate time of the murder. We know it was somewhere between 11.30 and midnight. Helen said she left Harvey's apartment around 11 to go home and pack. They were going to elope. When he didn't come for her, she got worried. She went back to his apartment around midnight, found him dead. But that story won't hold water if Martha's telling the truth. Yeah, if. You don't sound convinced. Are you, Joe? Uh, I don't know, Johnny. I don't know. It's a pretty nauseating shortage of facts in this case. Nauseating's the word for it, all right. No, I mean literally. When I get one like this, my stomach starts acting up. Joe, what have we got in the way of facts? Well, number one, Harvey Stone was shot in the forehead with a 38 Smith & Wesson sometime between 11.30 and midnight. Yeah. And even that fact got twisted around yesterday by Alvin Gentry when he made what he called a confession. He said he shot Stone in the chest with a Colt 45 and threw the gun in the river. Yeah. You told me you'd found out he was a friend of Helen's. His confession doesn't look good for her, believe me. I know. But I can't seem to lose my hunch that she's innocent. Look, Johnny, I, I don't blame you for trying. It's your job. What do you mean? Harvey Stone was insured for 150000 bucks by the company you represent. Yeah, that's right. Okay, his father E.J. Stone and his young stepmother Daphne are the joint beneficiaries. Now, if one of them should turn out to be the murderer, your company wouldn't have to pay off. Wait a minute, Joe, wait a minute. I think you know me well enough to figure I'd a lot rather see that company pay through the nose than convict an innocent person. Sure, but just about everything we've got points to Helen Barrett. Just about, but not quite. For instance? For instance, Harvey's father, E.J. Stone. He thought Harvey was running the business into the ground. He didn't like it. He also didn't like the fact that Harvey and his stepmother were pretty friendly. Yeah, a man in a wheelchair is liable to resent a lot of things. Yeah, well, that's just the point. E.J. can get out of his wheelchair when he wants to. I saw him out of it yesterday. Uh -huh. Sure. Then there's Daphne herself. She opposed the idea of Harvey marrying Helen. Said she wanted to protect the stone name. But that sounds pretty fishy coming from somebody who used to be a chorus girl herself. Did you ask her about that picture of her you spotted in Dutch Krieger's office? Yeah. She said that was all in the past. But I wonder. Dutch got kicked out of a business deal by Harvey. He wouldn't forget that, and he's a tough cookie. And there still could be a connection between him and Daphne. Here we go again. Could be. Okay, okay. So I guess what it all adds up to is just that I kind of got myself sold on Helen. Sure, I've been sold on people too. Sometimes it's ended up costing me. So now I just hold back and don't make up my mind one way or another. All right. It's turned out to be a pretty good idea too. Why don't you try it, Johnny? Expense account item 11, a double martini for me. Well, I thought over what Joe Rostelli had said. Sure, it was good advice not to get too sold on people, but it didn't help me much at the moment. I still couldn't believe Helen Barrett had killed Harvey Stone, but I had to admit that if she wasn't the killer, it left a lot of things unexplained. For one thing, Alvin Gentry's fake confession. It sure looked like he was trying to shield her, I checked and learned that he managed a supper club where Helen used to sing. I decided to have a talk with him. I found him at a corner table. Yeah? I'm Johnny Dollar. Gentry, we, uh, we met in Lieutenant Rostelli's office. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you. What about? About the Harvey Stone killing. There's nothing to talk about. I don't agree. I think there is. I made my confession. You guys didn't believe me. Well, now, that's because you got a few of the things wrong, Gentry. What interests me now is not your confession, but the reason you made it. What do you mean? Well, you said Harvey Stone had been making a play for your girl, a hatchet girl, wasn't it? You, you said that's why you killed him. So? So you said you didn't know Helen Barrett. I don't. But you're lying. Look, Dolly. We found out you're a friend of Helen's. You used to go with her, and you were waiting in her apartment the night of the murder when she left Harvey's and came home to pack. Well, how about it, Gentry? 
Okay, so I do know Helen, but she didn't kill Stone. How do you know? She couldn't have. She's not that kind. Oh, sure. You were waiting at her apartment that night. Why? I wanted to see her. What about? She used to sing here. She drew good crowds. I wanted her back. What kind of a mood was she in when she got to her apartment? What do you mean? Well, did she talk about Harvey Stone any? Did, did she seem mad or upset? I don't remember. Cut it out, Gentry. I want straight answers. Well, I guess they had a little argument. What about? I don't know. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Helen didn't kill Stone. She was... She was with me. You mean for a few minutes at her apartment? I mean longer than a few minutes. She was with me at the time of the killing. Now look, Gentry. I know you're trying to help Helen, but believe me, this isn't helping her. First you make a phony confession, and now all of a sudden you're giving her an alibi. Uh, sure, it was stupid of me to make that confession. You can say that again. But I realized later it wasn't necessary. I realized that Helen had been with me at the time of the killing. You're going to stick to that story? Sure I am. Under oath? Under oath. Perjury's a pretty serious thing, Gentry. Perjury's pretty hard to prove, Dollar. One thing seemed pretty clear. Alvin Gentry was apparently convinced that Helen had killed Harvey Stone. He was doing everything he could think of, even perjuring himself to shield her. And the more he scrambled, the worse it began to look for her. Then, too, there was the statement of Martha Winters, Harvey's secretary, that she'd seen Helen returning to his apartment at 11.30. That would put Helen back there during the time of the murder. I still wasn't completely convinced that Martha Winters was telling the truth, so I spent the rest of the afternoon checking on her to see what I could find out. And a couple of things I found out were pretty interesting. So interesting that I decided to try to run a little bluff on her. Dollar. Hello, Martha. I'd like to talk to you. Well, I, I was just on my way out. Well, this won't take long. All right. Please come in. Thanks. Well? It's about that statement you made to Lieutenant Rostelli this morning. Oh? Well, I really haven't anything more to add to it, Mr. Dollar. Look, I'm sorry, but I have an engagement. Yeah. Now. You told us this morning that you and Harvey Stone used to go together. But you called it off and were just uh, friends after that. Yes, that's right. Now, look, Mr. Dollar, But I... that isn't the story I picked up at the office of the Stone Corporation what? a while ago, Martha. The office? Now, what right have you to go snooping around that Sorry, office? Sorry, Martha, but snooping's my business. And you know, you pick up a lot of interesting information that way. Well, if you're going to listen to office For instance, gossip... I found out it was Harvey who called off the deal with no. you. No. And you've been carrying a torch for him ever since. There have been a couple of nasty scenes about That's it. That's a lie. Matter of fact, once or twice he'd almost made up his mind to can you, but each time he decided lies, not to. Lies, lies, all of it. Okay, okay. We'll let that go for a minute. Now, about your statement this morning. Mr. Dollar, I haven't time to stand here and repeat what I've already said. That's where you're wrong, Martha. You've got time to hear this. You'll take time. Well, what is it? You said you saw Helen heading for Harvey's apartment at 11.30. Yes, I did. Where were you at the time? Why, here. In your apartment, here? But your apartment's around the corner of the hall from Harvey's. Well, I... How could you have seen her from here? Well, I, I didn't mean I was in my apartment. I, I was at the entrance, just coming in. The front entrance, huh? Yes. But Helen came in the side entrance. You couldn't have seen her from the front. But she's lying. Anyway, I hadn't reached the front entrance yet. I, I was outside. Sorry, Martha. The doorman and the cop on the beat both would have seen Helen. I did. You lied, you... didn't you? No. You didn't see her at all. I... Well, it had to be, Helen. She's the one who killed him. I know she did. You lied, didn't you, Martha? If it hadn't been for her... If it weren't for her, maybe you'd be Mrs. Harvey Stone, huh? I didn't mean that. I I meant Harvey'd still be alive. I I just didn't want her to get away with you it. You lied, Martha. You didn't see Helen at all. <laughs> yes, I lied, Mr. Dolan. I lied. <laughs> My bluff about the doorman, the cop on the beat, and Helen coming in the side entrance had paid off. Looking at Martha, I didn't exactly feel like giving three cheers about it. But one thing was clear, though. The Harvey Stone murder case had just busted wide open again. Here's our star to tell you about the final episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, 
The wind-up. A gambler stakes his life on his hand and loses. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. Joe Rustelli at Homicide, Johnny. Glad you called, Joe. Got something new for you on the Harvey Stone murder case. Now, well, let's have it. Yesterday, Harvey's secretary, Martha Winters, told us she'd seen Helen Barrett approaching his apartment at just about the time he was murdered. Yeah? She just admitted to me that she lied. Oh? She wasn't in position to have seen anyone approaching the apartment at the time. Well, that maybe opens things up a little again. Yeah. I've got an item along that line, too, Johnny. What is it? Harvey's young stepmother, Daphne, up in Westchester County. Oh, what about her? I just found out she was here in the city the night of Harvey's murder. What? Yeah. Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account. America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to the Home Office, Northeast Indemnity Associates, Hartford, Connecticut. Assignment, the imperfect alibi matter, location, New York City. Expense account concluded. Item 13320, transportation to the Stone Estate in Westchester County to question Harvey's young stepmother, Daphne Stone. As a suspect in Harvey's killing, Daphne was very much alive again. Sit down, Johnny. Thanks. Nice out here. Mm-hmm. Drink? No, thanks. How's the investigation going? Well, that's what I came to talk about, Daphne. It uh, hasn't been going too well. Oh? I was under the impression that an arrest had been made. Helen Barrett's being held. Well, then... Helen Barrett could be the killer. A lot of things point in her direction. But there are a few that don't. What do you mean? Right from the start, you've been giving me incomplete answers or false answers. First, you told me it was Harvey's father, E.J., who opposed his plans to marry Helen. Then I found out you were the one who was fighting it. Look, I explained all that. It was because I didn't want you to get the wrong idea. Oh, yeah, yeah, so you said. You told me you opposed it because you didn't think the stone name should go to a supper club singer like Helen. Yes. But you yourself used to be a chorus girl. I explained that to you, too, Johnny. Okay. So you oppose the marriage for the dignity of the family and not just to keep Harvey at home with you. That's a vicious thing to say. I told you Harvey and I, being about the same age, were very good friends, true friends. Is that what your husband thought? You forget Harvey's father is confined to a wheelchair. Understandably, he might occasionally resent those who can be more active. That's another thing you didn't tell me, Daphne, that E.J. could get out of his wheelchair on occasion. I caught a glimpse of him out of it the last time I was here. Short periods only. And with considerable discomfort. So you and Harvey were friends. Like you and that gambler, Dutch Krieger, huh? Johnny, my patience is running out. I explained that Dutch was in the past. Completely in the past. Before my marriage. But Dutch got kicked out of a business deal by Harvey. And he wouldn't like a thing like that. Harvey acted perfectly properly. Really, Johnny. All right, just one more thing, Well, what is it? One thing more you didn't tell me. That you were in the city the night Harvey was murdered there. Well? I should have told you that, Johnny. I went into the city that evening because I knew Harvey was to have a meeting with Helen later that night. I wanted to talk to Harvey first. What about? I knew he was planning some definite action about her. So you wanted to talk him out of marrying her? If you want to put it like that, yes. What time was that? I saw him in his apartment about nine. I left before ten. Can anybody verify those times? I don't know. I see. What was the outcome of your talk with Harvey? He assured me he'd break off with Helen. You sure about that? Completely sure. I decided to stay at a hotel that night instead of coming back home. I suppose that's how the police knew I was in the city. It's Helen's story that when she saw Harvey later, they decided to elope. If I believed that, but I don't. I think she's lying. And how about you, Daphne? 
Have you given me the whole truth now? Yes, Johnny. The whole truth. Everything I've done has been done solely to protect the family name. Everything. Right then, I'd have given a lot to know just what that everything involved. Whether or not it also included some weird idea of killing Harvey to somehow protect the family name. Expense account item 14, 320, transportation back to the city. I got permission from Joe Rostelli to talk to Helen Barron. When they brought her into the interrogation room, she looked pale and tired. Hello, Johnny. Helen, several things I want to ask you about. Sit down. Sure. What? Martha Winters, for one. Harvey's secretary? What about her? Well, she made a statement that she'd seen you heading for Harvey's apartment around 11.30. That had put you inside there during the time of the murder. No. No, I'm sure it was later than that. Almost 12 when I got back there. Martha later admitted that she lied. But the question is, why? Still carrying the torch for Harvey? Yes, I guess she was. Next item is about Alvin Gentry. Lieutenant Rostelli told me about that confession Alvin made. He got all the details wrong. Caliber of the gun. Poor Alvin. What do you mean? Well, he'd always made it clear how he felt about me. But I didn't think he'd go that far. Well, how do you feel about him? I've always liked him very much. Used to go with him some. But I stopped when I started seeing Harvey. Did you talk to Alvin Long at your apartment that night? No. Just a few minutes while I was packing. <sighs> you know, you just talked yourself out of an alibi. What do you mean? Well, after Gentry's confession didn't sell, he was willing to swear you were with him during the entire period the murder could have taken place. <sighs> Johnny, why does an innocent person need an alibi? It helps in court. Believe me. Well, how'd you make out with Daphne and Helen, Johnny? Joe, remind me never to get involved with show people again. They make their living putting on an act, and I'm just country boy enough not to be able to tell the difference once in a while. They both gave you nice, straight stories, huh? Oh, yeah, sure. Real sincere. Look me right in the eye, both of them. But one of them was lying, huh? Daphne said Harvey told her he'd break off with Helen. But Helen says the two of them were planning to elope. Of course, Harvey might have changed his mind after talking to Daphne. Yeah, but that's something we're not going to be able to confirm now. No. Johnny, it's a cinch Alvin Gentry's convinced that Helen's guilty. I think he's holding back something. Guy doesn't stick his neck out that far without a reason. I know, but I still don't dig her motive. Well, suppose Daphne's telling the truth that Harvey broke up with Helen. Maybe she couldn't stand getting the brush off. Yeah, could be, all right. People can do some strange things under the name of love, Johnny, particularly when it turns to hate. And that can happen awful fast. Expenses... Items 15 and 16, a dollar 40 cab to my hotel and a dollar even for a pot of coffee in my room. One hour, three cups of coffee and half a dozen cigarettes later, I was still nowhere. I was beat. And then a weird little idea began pecking away at me. A couple of things Rostelli had said suddenly started adding up to a pretty fantastic answer. Maybe it wouldn't stand the light of day, but it was night now, and it was the only idea I could come up with. I decided to try it on for size. I went to the club Alvin Gentry managed. Oh, hello, Dollar. I was sort of hoping you'd be around again. Oh? Yeah, I want to talk to you, but not now. It's almost closing time. Uh, stick around, will you? I waited at the bar while the customers left. Twenty minutes later, Gentry and I were alone. He slid onto a stool beside me. Drink? Uh, no, no thanks, What's on your mind, Gentry? Well, I've been thinking about what you said the last time we talked about uh, perjury. Oh? I decided you were right, Dollar. They make it pretty tough on you for perjury. Yeah, they do. I'm withdrawing my statement that Helen was with me at the time of the murder. Well, that's probably the smart thing to do, Gentry. Sure, what's the use? I'm getting tired of being a sucker in this deal of fall guy. Oh? That goofed-up confession I made was bad enough. And I had to stick my neck out still further with that fake alibi for her. And for what? So you're withdrawing the statement, huh? Yeah. That's uh, probably what you came to see me about, huh? No. No, that isn't why I came to see you at all, Gentry. Hmm? And I wouldn't exactly call you a sucker. I think you're one of the smartest guys I've ever seen in a 
Sort of weird and twisted kind of way. What are you talking about? You played this whole deal real cagey right from the start. Everything you did was supposed to look like a cover for Helen. But instead of that, you were really trying to put a noose around her neck. You're out of your mind, Dollar. And that confession you made, Gentry, that's why I came to see you. To tell you it wasn't goofed up at all. You did kill Harvey Stone. You know, you've got a real weird sense of humor. Have I? A couple of things Lieutenant Rostelli said added up in my mind a few minutes ago. Love can turn to hate fast. And you'd have to have a good reason to do what you did. You wanted Helen bad. When she told you that night she was going to marry Harvey Stone, you couldn't stand the idea. If you couldn't have her, nobody could. You're talking crazy. You went to Harvey's apartment and killed him. Then you made that fake confession to look like you were shielding her. Actually, you were framing her. No. You knew we wouldn't believe you, and we wouldn't believe that alibi you offered for her. It all made her look more guilty by the moment. Dolly, you're forcing me to say something I didn't want to. Oh, what is it? Helen was mad at Harvey that night. I was worried. I followed her back to his apartment. When I got there, she was standing over the body with a gun in her hand. She said, why did I do it? She kept saying it over and over. That's why I made the fake confession to protect her. Sorry, Gentry. It's a little too late for that story now. I keep telling you that confession you made was legitimate. Are you crazy? I didn't even get the caliber of the gun right. Yes, you did. What are you talking about? We made a mistake. Harvey was killed with a forty-five Colt, just like you said. You're crazy. It was a thirty-eight Smith... Yeah. A thirty-eight Smith & Wesson. I know that. So do the police. So does the killer. But nobody else. It, it was in the papers. No, Gentry. It wasn't in the papers. You're dead wrong, Dollar. Dead wrong. He kicked a bar stool at me, and I dove behind the end of the bar. The lights went off. I had my gun out now, but I couldn't see anything in the dark. He couldn't get past me to the front door, but he could get out of the back. I had to locate him fast. Then my hand touched an ashtray at the end of the bar. I picked it up and tossed it toward the center of the room. I spotted the flash of his gun. Now I had him pegged. I found a lamp on one of the tables. Gentry was slumped in a corner. My shoulder. Help me. Don't worry, Gentry. You're not going to conk out. There's plenty left of you to stand trial. Final item on expense account, $12.80. Transportation and incidentals back home. Total expenses, $192.40. Rostelli arrived in response to my call and had Gentry carted away. Helen Barrett was released from custody. Remarks? Here I thought Dutch Krieger was the gambler in the case. But the little game of winner-take-all that Gentry had been playing was just about the weirdest I'd ever heard of. I thought about him up there in the death house at Sing Sing and realized that the big trouble with that kind of gamble that he was taking is that the loser's seat can get awfully hot. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Now here's our star to tell you about next week's story. Next week... One of the biggest, toughest, loudest characters I've ever met. A real two-fisted terror. And her name is Meg McCarthy. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. Written by Robert Reif, it is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone. Heard in our cast were Virginia Gregg, Tony Barrett, Shirley Mitchell, Will Wright, Chet Stratton, Ted Corsia, Barney Phillips, Lillian Baeff, and Harry Bartell. Musical supervision by Amerigo Marino. Be sure to join us on Monday night, same time and station, for another exciting story of yours truly, Johnny Dollar, Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs> 